Hey guys, since I get this question on a regular basis, I thought it'd be easier to answer it in a video as opposed to, you know, answering this question individually. And uh, besides, I think it would be really helpful to give my side of the story. And uh, yeah, I changed this person's name because I want to protect their identity. But anyway, Mr. Uh, I don't have a sense of humor from the state of uh, I need to Google the meaning of satire writes. Uh, Hi Gary, I'm a big fan of your channel, but it really upsets me when in each of your videos you speak negatively of Carpondros and Carpondro breeders. Uh, I mostly keep Amazon trees, but I do have a Carpondro and I think it's an amazing animal. Uh, what bothers me most is that you breed Jaguar carpets to diamond pythons, which are technically a hybrid, and when you visited John Martin's collection, you said only positive things about John's Northern Emerald Cross Amazon Basin Emerald Hybrids. Uh, so while I love your channel, aren't you a huge, huge hypocrite for busting on Carpondros while keeping and breeding hybrids yourself? Oh my God, yes! Hey guys, welcome to video number 19. You know what I'm going to do with you guys over the upcoming videos? Is this a baby green Sanzinia that's just starting to go through its onogenic color change? And this is a baby silver Savu Python also just starting to go through its onogenic color change. I know we don't get to see a lot of these too often. Um, so what I'm going to plan to do is I just thought it would be really cool if I could take you guys on that onogenic color change journey with me. And uh, I'll show you how they go through that over the next few videos. But it's, it's pretty awesome. So I'll keep you posted on that. Okay, first off, do not forget to like and subscribe to my videos. Thank you so much for doing that for me. I appreciate it. The one thing I always forget when I'm making these, these videos for my channel is that I have so many people who watch my videos from all over the world. I always thinking, shame on me, I'm concentrating on people in the United States, but I get letters from all over the world and I love everybody watching me and it's really appreciated. And uh, for example, at my last video we talked about albino chondros and we're talking about my friend Marshall Mendez. When I had mentioned, is there anybody out there who knows where there might be some albino chondros? And a gentleman reached out to me from Portugal and he sent me some photos of his albino chondros. So I'm excited to show you those albino chondros today and yes, they really do exist. Uh, and the next thing we're going to talk about are tail depressions in green tree pythons or actually arboreals in general. We're going to talk about what is a tail depression or a stress fracture and what does it look like and how can you prevent it and uh, unlike depression in humans which can be of course easily treated with drugs and alcohol uh, tail depressions unfortunately cannot be treated so the key thing is we have to learn how to prevent them and I'm gonna hopefully teach you how to do that today <laughs> Guys, I know it's tough to see, but right here where my finger is pointed, I'm going to try to put a graphic up of this as well, but this animal has a tail depression or a stress fracture, as it's more commonly known. They, are, they occur in both emeralds and in green tree pythons. So what is it? How do they occur? How can we prevent them? Let's talk about, you know, years ago when you'd get a chondro or get an arboreal in with a stress fracture, it's basically an indentation on top, on the top side of the animal. It's almost usually directly above the animal's cloaca. And we used to think if you got an animal with a tail depression, we'd look poorly on the person selling that animal. We would say, oh, it probably has a tail depression or probably has a stress fracture because the person probably tried to probe it when it was too young. Well, Yes, it can be problematic to probe an animal when they're too young, an arboreal, baby arboreal, when they're too young, it, was, it will be a problem. But we now know that typically stress fractures or, or tail depressions occur for two different reasons. The first is with baby, it occurs in younger animals, okay, and we know that in case of babies, typically the perches are too thick or they are too high, and I'm going to go into that further in a minute. Or in the case of older animals, before they're a year old, typically the, the perches are too thick. And these are the two primary reasons for tail depressions or stress fractures. So now let's talk about um, exactly how they occur and how we can prevent them. Okay, so in the case of babies, this is a perfect setup for a baby green tree python. This is not really much of a baby anymore. It's kind of a well-started animal, but here's why it's perfect. Because first off, the perch is not too thick, okay? It's nice and thin. And you know why I know it's not too thick? Because if you look at the underside of that animal, you can see it's body on, on the underside is it's touching each other it's you know it's not too far apart it basically it's wrapped around the perch and it's not resting on top of the perch if your animals are resting on top of the perch that's a good indication that the perch is too thick the second thing is this perch is not too high in this enclosure which is really the key thing about preventing a tail depression or stress fracture uh, first off you know these animals are so small in their babies 15 20 grams and especially when you're trying to feed them they go through the feeding trials and they're striking constantly they're holding on to the perch and they're striking at you constantly one third of their body is literally being lunged off that perch and if it's too high sometimes they'll kind of you know dangle underneath the perch if it was kept in a cambro box it would kind of dangle it's way too high 
But in the case of a shoebox, it's not too high because it's always going to rest on the bottom. It's nice and low, so when it strikes, and it's going to basically just rest on the bottom of the tub. That's not going to dangle, and if it's not going to dangle, it's not putting too much pressure. And the second thing, and more importantly, is when it does eventually grab the pinky mouse as a baby, and it's now holding that pinky mouse in its mouth, that adds a lot of weight to that animal. And again, that extra weight combined with the animal lunging at the prey item causes additional stress on the lower one-third of the body, right near the cloaca, and again, that's how you get a stress fracture or a tail depression. The thing about tail depressions or stress fractures is that you will not see it on your animal. As far as you're concerned, it's a perfect animal. However, when it hits about a year to two years old, suddenly you're going to see that indentation on top of that right above the cloaca on the upper side of the animal's body, and at that point it's too late. There's nothing you could do about it. And uh, so in the case of babies, that is how you're going to help prevent tail depressions or stress fractures. In the case of older animals and preventing tail depressions, how do we do that? Well, when I say older, first off, I'm still talking about an animal that is less than one year old. Because really, tail depressions, stress fractures are going to occur most likely in the first year of the animal's life. So older animals, six months, six to 12 month old animals, how are we going to prevent tail depressions? Well, height is not really an issue anymore. They have weight on them now, so they're not as sensitive with height, with the lunging at the prey item, they're, they're fine. But it's really the thickness of the perch we have to be concerned about. That first animal I showed you when I started this segment, that, that uh, almost two-year-old male with the tail depression, this is the thickness of the perch I had him on when he was just under a year old. He seemed fine on it, but he was more resting on it as opposed to wrap around, wrapped around it. And sure enough, here we are, two years later, I discovered he has a tail depression, and I have to assume it came from this thickness of perch. So how did I rectify the situation? Well, in this case, David Brahms, I called him my friend, specialty enclosure designs, and I started using this thickness of perch for my yearling animals. What I love about it is on the same perch, it has three different thicknesses, three different dimensions here. It allows the animal a choice, all those choices being much thinner than the original perch that I had been using for these Cambro tubs. So again, in the case of babies, low perches, uh, low perches and thin perches in the case of six to 12 month old animals, can't stress enough guys, thin perches. And if your animal looks like he's resting on top of the perches as opposed to wrapped around the perches, well, your perch is probably too thick. Also, will a female with a tail depression be able to pass eggs? Yes, as long as the tail depression is not too severe, an animal with a mild tail depression, a female, will be able to pass eggs without an issue. In the case of a male, whether it's a minor tail depression or a pretty severe tail depression, in most cases, I've had males with severe tail depressions actually breed without issue. It's not a problem at all. So you don't have to be overly concerned, but you know, because cosmetically, aesthetically, it just, it's not pleasing. And uh, it's easily to correct if you just make those changes when the animals are young with your purchase height and your purchase th uh, thickness. <laughs> Hey, so in my last video, we were talking about albino chondros when I was showing you my friend Marshall Mendez and how he has some possible uh, albino eggs hatching right now, or I should say cooking right now. He's got 14 eggs cooking. And in that video, I referenced that I heard there were some albino green tree pythons in Germany. Well, the gentleman who actually acquired those animals, he acquired them in 2020. He lives in Portugal. He reached out to me and said, hey, you talked about those chondros in your last video. And uh, I own them. They're my animals. And they meet the requirements of albinos. I'm going to show you, put some pictures up for you guys. But so let me tell you about them. What I, what I know about them is uh, they are 2017 pair. Again, he acquired them in 2020. Uh, they acquired them from somebody over in Germany. Uh, they have, they lack any melanism. They have uh, red pupils and they have pink tongues. So they are absolutely albinos. Um, he has plans to either possibly breed them together. He's going to line breed them, produce some hats. He's going to hopefully, we're going to just wish them all the best. With chondros, uh, you know, the cool thing about it is while there's some melanistic animals out there that exist today, uh, the reality is there are no true morphs really with chondros. So that's why I'm so excited when I see, you know, these albinos pop up. It just uh, gives really a lot of hope to the whole chondro community that we can get some more working. And uh, the key thing here is that I'm not going to mention this person's name that is intentional. He wished to stay anonymous at that time, at this time, which I completely understand. So in any event, the good news is there are albino chondros. They exist. The gen just gentleman's working with, with them. So between him and Marshall Mendez, I'm keeping my fingers crossed over the next couple of years or maybe even sooner, we're going to have some uh, albino chondros to check out. So this is by far the biggest Savu Python currently in my collection. She's a big female. She's about mm, five, six years old. Guy, I'm hoping she goes for me this year. She could easily give me a dozen eggs or more. So we're going to try her this year. Big girl. She's paradox pattern on her too. Um, in any event, thank you guys so much for watching as always. And again, please don't forget to like and subscribe to my videos. And US Arc, they do so much for us and ask so little from us so we can support them. It's only $5 a month, guys. That's all it's going to cost you. 
is to uh, support them. And uh, anyway, I'm going to see you guys really soon in my next video. Who has the best YouTube channel? Me?